we are good to go. Perfect. So thank you everybody for uh, being super patient with all the tech uh, excitement today. Um, welcome to the 10th virtual seminar in the biological physics and physical biology seminar series. Uh, it's unbelievable that 10 weeks have already passed by and please stay with us for many, many, many more weeks representing many, many, many more months. Um, today we have two treats which we will get, get to momentarily. Uh, first, Jasmine Nerodi from Rockefeller, who's had a very interesting meteoric rise. Uh, she is a fellow at Rock, independent fellow at Rockefeller right now, uh, future location TBD, uh, who's going to <laughs> talk to us about unraveling the mysteries of bacterial flagella. And then we will um, move to TJ's talk in the second half an hour of today's, uh, today's virtual seminar. And he is going to be speaking about deciphering mechanical code of the genome and epigenome. Uh, TJ is a pioneer, a leader, a uh, beloved mentor. And uh, with that, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand it to Jasmine after first reminding you of seminar format and etiquette. <laughs> um, so, so for those of you who are um, in the meeting, after all the excitement today, please use your full name in the Zoom so that we can acknowledge you while asking questions. Mute yourself during the talk. During the talk, if you have questions, type them into the chat box. If they are burning, I will jump in and ask the speaker as they are giving the talk. Otherwise, we'll come to them in the five minutes after the talk. And we will also have an extra 15 minutes at the end of the hour for all of us to hang out and have informal chats. Um, the talk is being recorded. And finally, thank you so very much for being supportive and enthusiastic as we have worked through these challenges today. With that, over to you, Jasmine. Thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Is, is it, this is, it's invisible to everybody? Good? Yeah. All right, great. Okay, so hi, everybody. Thanks for for sticking around and, and then coming back. Um, it's, it's, great to, it's great to be here. And I want to I wanna start off first by saying a big thanks to, to the organizers, to Sri, Meredith, Mo, and, and Kimberly for, for all their work in putting this great series together and, and for the invite to talk. So I've, I've really been enjoying all of the talks so far and, and the discussions that have been going on afterwards. And so I'm super excited to take part in the series and also to spend some time today chatting with everybody about bacterial flagella. Um, so I'll start with a, a little introduction. She already covered most of this, but I'm, I'm currently an independent fellow at Rockefeller Center for Physics and Biology and a research fellow at All Souls College in Oxford. So a lot of the work that I'll talk about today was done while I was in Oxford, but this talk is coming to you from lockdown in, in New York. Uh, so in general, my research focuses on organismal locomotion, and as such, I, I've been super lucky to have gotten to work with some really interesting systems and, and some really charismatic organisms. Uh, but bacteria and, and flagellated bacteria in, in particular have, have been keeping me pretty occupied for, for a while now. Um, and so over 80% of, of known bacterial species swim using flagella. And, and we know a lot of bacterial species, right? So if you kind of take a poll across all living systems, flagellated swimming would essentially win by, by a landslide in the popular vote for ways to get around. Um, and so accordingly, there's, there's a rich body of work out there on, on various aspects of flagellar biology. But, but there's still also so, so, so many open questions and mysteries that are left to figure out, a, a few of which I've been working on and that I'll talk about today, and then a few more that I'll mention at the end that I'm really excited to, to start working on. So my work mainly centers around questions about the physics of how organisms interact with natural environments. And, and in particular, how they deal with the fact that these environments can be spatially complex or heterogeneous or, or can fluctuate in time. And, and historically, biology and physics have, have been intertwined a long time within biomechanics. And I think this linkage in particular might be completely unsurprising to, to this audience because a lot of the talks 
um, in the series or parts of them that we've heard and that we will hear fit within this general umbrella. So th these kind of questions cover systems of, of different sizes from proteins or microorganisms like Wallace uh, covered in his talk on flagellar lens regulation and clammy and um, to bigger animals that, you know, we as little kids might have seen skittering around in the forest. Um, for instance, Orit Pellet gave a really great talk about how bee swarms adapt their shape when they get perturbed uh, mechanically by the environment or you know, by the setup that she built in her lab. Um, and, and coming up in a couple months, Itai Cohen is going to talk about all the fancy maneuvers that flies can make. So that, that's something to, to look forward to as well. And then so it's obvious that there's lots of really interesting questions about how organisms are dealing with changes in their environment during their lifespans or, um, or within an experiment that we're performing. So timescales of seconds, hours, a few years even. Um, but, but there's also so many interesting questions that can be asked about adaptive morphologies or body plans and behaviors that happen within single species and in between neighboring clades over evolutionary timescales. So shown here on, on the geological time end of the x-axis. So for example, in, in the very first talk of this year series, Eleni Katapori gave an awesome talk about biological flows in animal cir circulatory systems, which uh, have reached kind of their current state after millions of years of evolution. So I placed it here, um, at about 500 million years ago, which is when the first triple bus came out, but I'm happy to chat about all your preferred placements of this circle in, in the discussion afterwards. But for the, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna zoom in on, on this, which I think is an equally fascinating corner uh, to talk about flagellated swimming in bacteria. So we've heard a bit about eukaryotic flagella so far, for instance, in, in Wallace's talk, but, and, and I probably don't have to explain this too much to this audience, uh, bacterial and eukaryotic flagella are, are completely different organelles with completely different evolutionary origins. So instead of being driven by linear motors that go up and down the filament, uh, bacterial flagella are driven by a rotary motor that sits at its base called the bacterial flagella motor that connects to the flagella filament via a flexible protein hook uh, shown here. But for the, the reason that I originally got interested in flagellar locomotion, it's, it's a bit further down that timescale axis to the right. Uh, I mentioned already that out of all the bacterial species that we know, over 80% of them use flagella. So unsurprisingly, uh, flagellar number and arrangement across bacteria can be, can be really diverse. And you can see that here. I'm showing here some uniflagellate species, some biflagellate species, some polyflagellates. And, and what's more, these species don't just kind of look very different from each other, but they also live in this wide, wide range of environments from, from the human gut uh, to the deep sea hydrothermal vents, which, which I hear is pretty different from, the, from our intestines. But uh, so the, maybe the bit that's actually a bit surprising is, is that this diversity of organisms and the environments that they live in are all driven by a nanomachine that has a strongly evolutionarily conserved core set of proteins. And I'm showing this here in, in these solid colored regions. So even though it was this kind of initial diversity that, that really drew me in, it, it made sense to first focus on, on these shared parts. And, and to me, that meant developing a better comprehensive understanding of, of the function of this motor which is uh, to generate torque and to spin the flagellar filament. And that, that process happens here at the interface between the, these two strongly conserved regions that are uh, conserved across characterized species. And so during my PhD, I worked quite a bit towards developing a mechanistic model of how torque at this interface is generated. But actually, th this turned out to be a bit more of a moving target than we had expected. And we, we went in expecting it to be pretty motile. Um, but the rate at which we've been getting new structural and functional information over the last few years has been really exciting and astounding. And, and we constantly are having new things to take into consideration when updating our models. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight a couple right here. Really excitingly, actually, recently, there were two um, beautiful high resolution structures that came out, one right after the other of the flagellar stator. Uh, they really switched up the details of how exactly we think about this process. 
So uh, I won't talk more about these here except to leave these up and recommend them, um, recommend these references really highly to you. Um, but I'm more than happy to chat about these and their implications offline or afterwards. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, a more general overview of the structure uh, will do. Uh, the motor consists of three general parts, a spring-like hook that connects the body of the motor to the flagellar filament, a rotor that consists of these concentric protein rings that go through the cell wall. Um, it's called the rotor because it, it rotates with respect to the cell, and, and the motor stator, which consists of these uh, MOT units. In E. coli, so each motor can have anywhere between one to 11 of these units, and each of these units is connected to the peptidoglycan layer here. Uh, so the stator is stationary with respect to the cell. And the stator is responsible for generating torque uh, here at the interface between the MOT A cytoplasmic loops and these fly G proteins that sit along the periphery of the cytoplasmic C ring of the rotor. Um, in each of these units, they also have an ion channel associated with them, which is how the motor uses the energy uh, in, that's stored in the transmembrane ion gradient to convert it to mechanical torque. And so back when we knew a very little more than what I've kind of just given you about the, what the motor looked like, what we did have is, is functional data from, from biophysical experiments. And so here I'm showing some data from, from 2000 that came out of Howard Berg's lab at Harvard that determined the torque speed curve in the E. coli motor. So each of these points represents the measurement that was taken from an immobilized bacterium. So we take a bacterium and you stick it down onto a microscope cover slip, and shear off its flagellar filament, and, and replace it with the polystyrene bead. So using microscopy, we can then get out the rotation speed of each bead. And then we can calculate out the motor torque that's needed to rotate a bead of that size at that speed. And this calculation is, is really straightforward since the bead and the motor are so small and then we're moving at a very low Reynolds number environment. So this is an estimate of that. Now I'll quickly note that we are slightly underestimating this value uh, if we use the equation that's up, up here because we're not taking into account the, the contribution of the hook. Uh, but the picture is not to scale and, and actually the hook is really small in comparison to the bead. So we're assuming that this, this contribution isn't, isn't too high. Uh, but so basically by using beads of, of all these different sizes, we can kind of sweep across this curve. And so this experiment, of course, is this kind of artificial environment. It uh, is done in the lab, we're shearing off the flagellar filament. But the points on this curve actually are important for real life bacteria. Um, and it, it does actually represent the functional range of, of this motor. So for instance, free swimming bacteria live mostly here in, in the low torque, high motor speed region. Uh, flagellar filaments are thin and they don't impart that much torque onto the motor on their own. But bacteria are constantly just interacting with lots of stuff, right? They're interacting with surfaces and swarms of other bacteria, um, thicker fluids like mucus, and all of these interactions can land them over here in, in the high torque region. And so these complicated lives that bacteria are living are forcing them to deal with lots of these environments and, and transitions between them, which means their flagellar apparatus also have to be able to. And so these are kind of the gist of the question that my work on bacteria focused on, um, which is how does the flagellar motor's mechanics, chemistry adapt and allow it to function in this range of environments that the bacteria has to move through. And conversely, what are the features of the environment that are influencing the motor's behavior? And so when I first started thinking about this motor um, during my PhD ages ago, it helped me to wrap my mind around it, its function by thinking about uh, a macroscopic analogy. And, and the structure to me, I think, lends itself very nicely to that of a, a playground merry-go-round. So the rotor is, is ring-shaped and it's lined with these protein spokes. Uh, so it looks like the merry-go-round itself. And, and we act as, as the helpful stators that are pushing it along to entertain our friends. And so of, co of course, the, you know, the physics of the microscopic world and the, the macroscopic world are very different and the forces that are involved in spinning a motor and spinning a merry-go-round are also very, very different. And uh, like I mentioned, 
we've been working to understand the exact physics of the fundamental torque generation process. And also, like I mentioned, I'm super happy to chat about this offline. But for the rest of this talk, uh, to answer the questions that are on the last slide, we're going to be more concerned about how the motor as a whole responds and adapts to environmental changes. And so for that purpose, this kind of high level, bit fantastical overview turns out actually to work surprisingly well. And so back to this curve, uh, the motor, like a merry-go-round, can, can go at a, a wide range of speeds. And when, when the load is, is low, so say our you know, best friend wants to be pushed around, we're, we're happy to oblige, we're happy to take part in it. The, they don't make the merry-go-round too heavy, it's, it's, not, it's not too exhausting for us to take on the job. But then people, other people on the playground, you know, see how much fun this all is and they all want to join in. And for a while it's fine, but then, then the load starts getting heavier and heavier and it, it gets a lot tougher. And at some point you might want to recruit some friends to help you. And then this is a good strategy. And in fact, it's the, the strategy that the flagellar motor or um, more and more accurately the flagellar stator uses. So it was observed in E. coli that motors that are operating at high load have far more stator units pushing the motor along than at low load. But the, the nature and the dynamics of this transition was, was not known. And, and this is kind of what we wanted to get at. Because the motor has to deal with this wide range of environments that is represented by this entire curve uh, because bacteria have to deal with it during their lifetime. And so going back to the, the questions that I kind of posed a, a few slides ago, we can hone in on three more pointed lines of inquiry. Uh, so first, what are the environmental factors that are driving remodeling in the flagellar motor? Um, and what does this mean for, for the motor itself at the molecular level? What does this remodeling actually entail? And, and finally, to me, I think this is the, the most interesting question. Uh, on what time scale does this remodeling happen? So do bacteria kind of adapt within a single generation as they're transitioning between these different lifestyles or do they adapt across generations so that you know, their, their progeny can have better lives? And so to start getting at this, we, we constructed a model of stator engagement and disengagement onto the rotor. So uh, engagement is characterized by an arrival rate K on, disengagement by a leaving rate K off. And, and we wanted to ask the question, is the arrival rate, the leaving rate, or, or both sensitive to environmental factors, what the bacterium is experiencing? And, and for this, we kind of focused in on, on external torque because there, there's been lots of evidentiary support that the motor has an, is an inherent mechanosensor. And so to answer this question, we, we turn back to our, our lab E. coli and our trusty bead assay that I described earlier. So at the, at the start of the experiment, you can see here that the, the motor is just spinning along with um, some number of stators present. And on the, the right here, I'm showing an average over, over many cells. Um, now this on its own doesn't give us that much information about what's happening as bacteria are moving across this curve. Using a, a single bead assay, we, we get a picture of what the motor is doing at a single load on this curve. Uh, the position of which is determined by what size bead we're using. So if we use a, a smaller bead, we can get closer to stalling the motor at higher loads, uh, at lower loads, sorry. Or by using a bigger bead, we can move over to the high load region. But once a bead is, is attached to the motor, it, it's on there. We can't really get it off and switch it to another one without just killing the motor altogether. So, so using a standard bead assay, we could confirm what the other studies had already suggested about the motor, lower loads is lower number of stators. But like I mentioned, what we were keen on understanding is the dynamics. What happens when bacteria are moving between environments? And so what we did was, instead of using uh, plain polystyrene beads as, as the standard commercial ones, we used instead super paramagnetic dyna beads, which allowed us to exert an external torque on the motor and manipulate it uh, by using an external magnetic field. So these, these experiments were done initially by Ashley Nord when she was at Oxford with uh, Richard, uh, in Richard Berry's group. And uh, she used two mounted permanent magnets that exerted torque on the beads such that the motor gets stalled at an equilibrium angular position where the magnetic torque um, equals and cancels out the motor torque. And, and this position is maintained for, for five minutes. 
after which the, the magnets are raised and the motor is allowed to sprint, uh, spin freely again. And so you can see that during this, this initial stall period, the torque on the motor is near stall and then the stator number just jumps up here as stator units are recruited to the motor. And so once the torque is renewed, the motor relaxes back to its original stator number. And from this relaxation, we can get out uh, the characteristic time and the steady state no, uh, stator number which we can then use within the context of our model to get out estimates of the K on and K off. And so we repeat this across different bead sizes, which then allows us to get out how those rates in our model look as, as we, like, like bacteria, move across this curve. So the magnets, when we turn them on, for instance, pull them over here near the stall torque. And then once the beads are released, the relaxation processes take us to various points here on the right determined by the bead size. But based on the, the smallest commercial beads that we could find, we couldn't quite get to the low torque region using this experimental setup. But we really wanted to, to get a full picture of this process. And, and so we had a little bit of a brainstorm and we realized that instead of using permanent magnets that take us in, in this direction, using the same magnetic beads, we could go in the other direction by using a rotating field that would allow us then to access this entire curve, uh, including the low torque region. And so some people uh, in the audience might be familiar with electrorotation, which is a, a pretty similar concept that was introduced actually by, by Richard Berry, uh, who I was working with at Oxford while he was a postdoc in Howard Berg's lab in, in the late 90s or, or early 2000s, I think, uh, to, to apply various uh, levels of external torque to a tethered cell using a rotating electric field. And, and so, in fact, while we were doing this experiment in Oxford, a uh, postdoc in Howard's lab, a current postdoc in Howard's lab at Harvard, uh, Navish Vadwa, was using electrorotation to, and they actually got at some quite similar conclusions, which I was, I was actually really happy about as a nice victory for reproducible science. But anyway, uh, so this setup was also really nice for us because we didn't have to worry about our inability to switch out beads on a single motor. So we weren't limited to what load we could measure on a cell by the bead size. And, and this allowed us also to re uh, reduce a lot of our cell to cell variability because we were able to test the effect of a wide range of loads uh, on a single bacterium. So on the, on the right here, instead of a population average, I'm showing you the, a trace from a single motor. And you can see the motor is moving along uh, happily at about 45 hertz without any interference from us. And even at equilibrium, you can see that there's still some baseline on and off rates. Uh, it seems like tired stators are coming off the motor and pretty quickly being replaced by, by some refreshed ones. And then we, we turn the magnet on and the speed jumps up to 200 hertz because uh, we force it to. And then, and then we let go and we see how the bacterium is doing and we find there's already some remodeling going on. As you can see, the speed has fallen a bit from baseline. And, and we do this again and, and so on until we get a clear time course for how the stators can behave at this particular load and speed. And then we repeat this across many different loads and across many different bacteria to get out the statistic to use in the context of the model that we presented earlier to see how on and off rates vary across this curve. So putting all this together, what we find is that the on rate isn't actually dependent on external conditions, but Jasmine. the off rate. Yep. Jasmine, just so you know, you have about three minutes. Got it, yeah. But the off rate is. Uh, so the stator units come by to check on, on their hardworking friends pretty regularly, despite how tough the job actually is. Uh, but if they see that they're needed, then they stay for a bit longer. So, so this kind of bond, which uh, grow stronger with uh, larger external force is, is termed a catch bond. And it's been shown actually to be a pretty popular strategy for mechanosensing in, in molecular systems. I think it's popping up more and more in, in molecular biology nowadays. Um, but, but I started with the macroscopic analogy. So I think I'll, I'll conclude with one too. Uh, I guess we all remember getting these, these finger traps in our Christmas stockings as kids. So if you kind of uh, put your fingers in and if you panic and you try to pull your fingers out you'll find that the the tube tightens and then escape becomes impossible but the only way to actually to get out is to just relax and apply uh, a little less force to let the bond go slack uh this is a, it's a strategy we learned as kids and it's a strategy that the flagellar motor seems to have learned as well 
Um, so, okay, back, circling back to this chart, uh, I'll spend the, the first, I spent the first 20-ish minutes uh, focusing on, on a certain corner of this chart on how the bacterial flagellar motor remodels itself within seconds to minutes in response to external load. And that the nature of that mechanosensitivity behaves like a catch bond, which grows stronger with, with external load. But within this bigger picture, um, I've had the chance to work with some really cool animals. So like geckos that can run along the surface of water. Uh, this was joint work with Judy Jin and, and Bob Cole's group at Berkeley. Um, and the water bears that lumber on under the surface. This is actually ongoing work right now with uh, Lisette Duran Rosario, a grad student in Daniel Cohen's group at, at Princeton. And, and these systems, were really, really fun to work with, and they are really fun to work with, and they might seem a bit more charismatic than bacteria, and I'm always super, super happy to talk more about these projects later offline, but I want to spend the, the last minute or two talking about how questions just from flagellar biology can fill up this chart all on their own. So at the start of this talk, I, I gave a quick overview of the amazing diversity in flagellar morphology um, among bacterial species. Uh, but now with the brilliant advances in, in structural information combined with our functional experiments and, and our modeling efforts, I really think that we're in, in this kind of prime position as a field to start getting at some of these super ambitious questions regarding microbial diversity and the selective pressures that have shaped uh, all the evolutionary paths to get these guys everywhere that they are today. Um, but honestly, if we talk about microbial diversity, we don't really even have to be at the evolutionary end of the time scale. Uh, microbial diversity is also super important and interesting um, more immediately. So flagellar number can vary a lot between closely related species and even among clonal populations. So if I was to grow up a flask of genetically identical E. coli, some of them will have two flagella, some of them will have six. And, and so there's a lot of questions kind of underlying how this variation affects bacterial performance in, in swimming and in biofilm formation. And so uh, for now, right now, I'm working with Hannah Dayton, who's a grad student in Lars Dietrich's lab at Columbia on, on some of these questions. And in fact, also, uh, Sujit Tata will talk next week about some new exciting work from his group about how flagellated bacteria navigate through porous media. And, and I will be live tweeting it from the BPBB account. So uh, you should get excited for awesomeness of like flagellated bacteria two weeks in a row. Okay, and so with that, I'll, I'll stop there now. And I just wanna thank some of the places that have supported this work uh, and some of the people that I've been really lucky to, to work alongside. Uh, especially I wanna highlight here, Ashley Nord, who did the stationary magnet experiments that I showed uh, when she was in Richard Berry's group at Oxford. She now has her own group at CNRS in Montpellier. So if there are trainees listening who are interested in these kind of questions, you should absolutely get in touch with Ashley. She does wonderful science awesome to work with and her lab is on uh, the south coast of France. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at 25 minutes but I don't think I need to pitch that anymore. So, so thank you everybody for, for listening. Um, thanks so much for a terrific talk. Uh, Grace under pressure, Jasmine. Um, at the moment um, I see a comment from uh, Jianhe. So I'm going to ask Jianhe if you want to unmute and turn your comment into a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> so Jasmine, um, yeah, you talk about the catch bond, you know, that is something very interesting. So, you know, um, a few years ago, I, uh, Kit Number Fun by we published a paper try uh, use this uh, rotor state interaction to, to explain the switching rate, right? The rate dependent switching rate of the real motor. That's a 2012 uh, uh, PRL paper. So I want to see if, uh, is there any relation? Do you mean the switching rate, meaning the, the counterclockwise to clockwise switching rate? Uh, yeah, non, uh, uh, you know, the first it increase, then decrease the rate, the switching rate. I see, I see. Um, it's, it's possible. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know if it's the same linkage. I would, I would be surprised if it was because the switching rate, I think more has to do with switches in the, in the fly G conformation. So it's, it's more related to um, a, a functionality of the rotor rather than the stator. And, and this catch bond, this mechanosensitivity uh, relates to um, 
connections with the MOT B and the peptidoglycan layer. So I think I think there's kind of lots of different dynamic things that are going on constantly in 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 the motor, right? I think I think possibly that that might have to do with remodeling that happens with um, with the fly N and fly N ring, which have also been shown to be really dynamic. There's a there's a really nice review that um, Sam Tusk and um, Richard put out uh, last year about kind of general uh, dynamic uh, remodeling in proteins that we often think proteins as being these kind of like static uh, entities, but they're constantly being remodeled a lot of these these big molecular machines. I see. Um, Robin, you have your hand raised. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, uh, Jasmine, uh, Howard Burke worked a lot on the switching between running and tumbling, where phosphorylation of transmembrane proteins took care of the adaptation. Is this adaptation mechanism for running and tumbling completely independent of the mechanism you described for adding or subtracting uh, stator units? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. I I don't I don't think anything is ever independent <laughs> within, the, within the system. But um, the 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 particular strains that we work with are not uh, they don't have the ability to to sense chemotactic gradients, and we keep them in homogeneous in, in the environments anyway. So this this uh, phenomena that I'm describing does happen independent of the run and tumbling, but. Uh, also, the run and tumbling, like the the mechanism that I described uh, with Jin Ma, is more related to conformational changes in the rotor rather than in the stator. So what I was talking about was mostly mechanical uh, remodeling in 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 the stator structure, but the the rotor also is constantly being dynamically uh, remodeling. There's lots of protein exchange happening in at the, at the level of the protein rings that are going through the cell wall. And the run and tumbling has more to do with that kind of remodeling. Yeah. Um, run and tumbling also has a static component where you have transmembrane proteins which get phosphorylated at different stages. That's, as far as I know, connected to the stator. But uh, I'm, thanks oh, for the yeah, response. The, the, sense, the, sensing, the sensing part. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the sensing part, yes, but the, the actual mechanics of it happen at the at the rotor level. So yeah, I was imagining that the sensing that you could have also using this sensing to adjust the stator. Yes, very, very. Uh, that that's a, that's a great point, and yes, that's that's definitely true. And we're actually we're actually pretty interested in in getting out what features other than other than external torque uh, feed into this process. And so we've been looking, uh, for instance, at, at IMF. So we, we've been doing some work on, on looking at kind of how, how uh, changing out the, the, the gradient, the ion gradient also affects stator exchange. And we, and we do find that it, that it does. Exactly how, we don't know yet. We're working on quantifying it, but there definitely are other things at play. Thank you on very much. Note, <laughs> on that note, I think, um, thanks again, Jasmine. Um, shout out to Arnold, who's live tweeting um, our seminars today. And over to TJ if you would like to share your screen.